Welcome back to Simple Entomology for the Fly Tire and Fly Fisherman Part 6. I'm Raj Kletke and in this video we'll be finishing up on midges. When broadly defined, midges are very diverse with literally thousands of species, some of which may be locally important. However, to keep this simple, we will concentrate on the common midges we fly fish with. In the previous video, we looked at the life cycle of midges, looked at the larva and flies we might tie to fish larva. We also looked at the midge pupa, which I felt was far more important than the larva, looked at beadhead pupa patterns to fish relatively deep, glass bead pupa patterns to fish in the mid-current, and pupa patterns to fish in the surface film. We even looked at a midge soft hackle that I used to fish as a stillborn midge. While we didn't directly discuss it, all of these patterns do fulfill Hewitt's factors quite well, with the possible exception of the soft hackle that I use for a stillborn midge. Most stillborn midges will still have an attached pupal skin. So yes, I do occasionally tie a shuck on the soft hackle. Let's consider Hewitt's factors again before tying our midge adult. The midge adult, as it emerges from the pupa skin, usually flies quickly away, but if there is any wind that blows it onto still water, it can literally walk across the water, causing small dimples. So as we tie our adult midges, let's think of reproducing the dimpling on the water surface that the legs of these adult midges would make. The classic fly that creates dimples on the surface is, of course, the Griffith's gnat. There are many excellent videos on how to tie the Griffith's gnat, so I will not repeat that here. The Griffith's gnat can serve as both a single adult and as a midge cluster. Midge clusters occur both during emergence and later during egg laying when they could be considered mating clusters. I'm showing relatively large Griffith's gnats here for video purposes but normally they would be tied on size 18 and smaller hooks. Let's tie some more adult midges. I'm tying this fly on a size 16 hook for video purposes, but normally it would be on 18 to 24 size hooks. After laying a base of thread, I measure the tail for length, approximately the same length as the hook shank, and then pre-clip it and tie it in place using thread tension to take it from the side of the hook to the top of the hook, and then try to cover most of the tail material and bring the thread forward to just slightly in front of the halfway point. I then take a hackle sized for the hook, strip some fibers from the base, and tie the hackle in place with the concave surface facing the bend of the hook. After wetting the thread, I apply some dubbing. I'm using black thread and black dubbing here, but any of the colors we've discussed in a previous video would be acceptable. Making a dubbed thorax is purely optional, but I like it as it makes the diameter of the hook slightly greater, keeping more hackle fibers per wind, and also keeps the hackle fibers a little more upright. As you can see, I wind the dubbing a little behind the hackle, but mainly in front of the hackle, until I'm approximately one eye length from the front of the hook. I then wind the hackle in the usual fashion. I like using my rotary vise for this, but obviously the hackle could be wound by hand. I try to make as even turns as possible without catching any of the hackle fibers. Once it's near the front of the hook, I tie off the hackle in the usual fashion, and then clip the excess hackle and whip finish. While I finish this fly, let's look at it closer. The first thing you notice is that it has a tail while midge adults do not have tails. 
Also, earlier I mentioned that when midges emerge from the pupa skin, they rapidly fly away and are not that readily available to trout. However, as I'm fishing this in relatively quiet water, many midges have difficulty breaking through the surface tension and there are many stillborns and emergers. What I believe the tail represents is remaining pupa skin, in other words, a shuck. If indeed this is an emerger, I want it to ride flush in the surface film, so I trim off the bottom hackle fibers. This allows it to ride flush in the surface film. Incidentally, tied in the proper colors, this is an excellent blue wing olive pattern also. Almost as easy to tie as another midge pattern that I use. Again, I put the tail on as before, but now I'm going to be tying it as a parachute so it automatically rides low in the surface film. I use a foam post here, clip off the excess foam, and tie the base tightly to the top of the hook. After that is completed, I will post up the foam in the usual fashion by putting a small thread bridge in front of the foam and then putting a thread around the base of the foam. Again, you can see I like using my rotary vise to put it in a position that makes it easy to put this base of thread. And then move the thread forward and tie in the proper size hackle after stripping some fibers from the stem. I tie the hackle tightly to the front of the hook, bring it tight against the post, and then I like to tie my hackle up the base of the post so that the first fibers will start near the top of the base of the post. Once that's done, I can wrap the hackle in the usual fashion making sure that each wrap is below the wrap above it. In this case, I have the concave portion of the hackle facing posteriorly and then down. This is the way I usually make my parachute hackles. And then tie off the hackle at the post and then the thread at the eye of the hook before whip finishing in the usual fashion. After clipping the thread and the excess hackle, I then turn the fly over and reapproximate the hackle fibers as necessary before cutting my post to length. Usually all I need is a short post. It's not representing a wing, but it does give me a little indicator that I can actually follow the fly. This fly, as a parachute pattern, already rides quite low in the surface film, but if you want it to ride even lower, there's another easy variation. This slight modification starts exactly the same as the previous fly, but now when I add the hackle, I am putting the convex side of the hackle facing back, which when I wrap it up the post, means that the convex side of the hackle will be facing down as I do my wrapping as before. For some, this is a little easier to tie off the hackle at the post without trapping hackle fibers, but it gets tied off exactly as before and whipped finish at the eye of the hook just like before. You can see that this particular fly would ride lower in the surface. I, however, tend to tie with the concave side down rather than the convex. I'm not sure it makes any difference to the fish, but some fishermen prefer this style.
We now have numerous midge patterns in size 18 and smaller and know that trout see midges almost every day of the year and on all water types. So when and where do we fish midges? Or why aren't we fishing midges every time we go out? Before we answer that, we have to look at how trout live and feed. Assuming we're on a trout stream and that there's adequate oxygen, in other words, the water temperature is not too warm, the trout daily needs are quite simple, mainly protection from the current and predators and food. The food rule that is stated in every fishing book in some form is that the trout must get more energy from the food it captures than the energy expended to capture it. This becomes very important as midges are extremely small and therefore have very little food energy. Of course, not all trout are eating. They may be dormant, lying in protected areas. This may be because there's not an adequate food source at the time or because they are frightened. During a non-frightened but still dormant time, you may catch a trout, especially with a streamer, I'll often add a midge pupa or a small soft hackle as a dropper off the streamer, but a midge by itself would generally be a poor choice. A trout foraging or cruising in relatively shallow still water is expending very little energy but is giving up a lot of protection, so usually a lot of organisms will be present. If breaking the surface, it is probably eating something in the surface film, which includes midges, spinners, and other organisms. If you can't find spinners or see what organism it is, a surface midge pattern, often indicator dry fly, is probably a good choice. If the feeding is heavy, I would likely start with one of the surface pupa patterns, but if the feeding is very sporadic, I would use one of the adults washed into the surface film. Foraging fish in moving water are expending a lot of energy, and a streamer is more likely to be a good choice than a midge. We'll discuss drift feeding in much greater detail in a future video, but for now, let's look at how this applies for fishing a midge. When trout are feeding opportunistically, they will often take a midge as a midge is recognized as a food item. However, midges are small and they will generally not move far from their protection to take a midge. A midge as a dropper off a larger searching nymph, however, may be an excellent choice. If a trout is feeding selectively on midges, it is usually to the deep pupa midge, the pupa midge as it rises through the mid currents, or the superficial pupa midge in the subsurface film. Occasionally it may be due to adult midges or midge clusters on the surface during emergence or egg laying. Midges, of course, are small, so are less likely to be taken in rapid water where the trout has to expend a lot of energy to get the midge. However, in flat or very slow water, trout do not need to expend much energy to get midges, and the midge pupa have trouble breaking through the surface film, so become concentrated in the surface film. Therefore, any time the current slows, which may be through the entire stream, edges of the stream, eddies, or any backwash areas, even with still water, fishing a midge pupa or midge adult may be very worthwhile. When you see rising fish in relatively slow currents and no other organism, We'll talk about rise forms more in future videos. However, if you have a relatively quiet or calm rise in relatively still water, it is very likely to a midge or a spinner. Look closely and make a choice. However, if it's an aggressive rise in rapid water, even if you don't see an organism, it's more likely a larger food source such as a caddis, which we'll start discussing in the next video. So when do I use a midge? I most commonly use a midge when my other flies aren't working. I use a deep midge pupa as a dropper off a searching nymph and off a searching dry fly, most commonly a caddis pattern. I also use a superficial midge pupa or an adult midge pattern off an indicator dry fly when I see rising fish in still water and no other obvious organism. By using the midge as a dropper, I can overcome two issues. 
One is the psychological issue of whether a large fish will take such a small fly. The other is the issue of where is my midge. When I use it as a dropper off of a nymph, I am usually using an indicator rig. When I am using it as a dropper off a dry fly, the dry fly serves as the indicator. If you haven't used midges in your fishing, get some 6 and possibly 7x tippet and start using them as droppers. You'll be pleasantly surprised with the result. In the next video, Simple Entomology for the Fly Tire and Fly Fisherman, Part 7, we'll be starting to look at caddis. See you soon.